everybody. I want to welcome you all to the LGBT Elder Housing Summit. The day we've all been waiting for has finally arrived. My name is Mina Bavan, and I work at HUD's Office of Policy Development and Research, and I'm here to introduce my Assistant Secretary, Dr. Rafael Bostic. Dr. Bostic has served as the Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research since July 2009. He is a key advisor to the Secretary on HUD departmental policies, programs, as well as legislative and, bu and budget issues. Assistant Secretary Bostic is an economist, having earned his PhD in economics from Stanford University and his BA from Harvard. He has spent some of his time working on discrimination issues. As a professor at, USC, at USC's School of Policy, Planning, and Development, he has completed some research on how anti-discrimination laws affect minority home ownership. Assistant Secretary Bostic is truly committed to all that he works on. Among, several important, among the several important initiatives that he is working on, he is currently interested in developing, in developing policies that support LG, LG, LGBT elders given the many barriers that they face. Some evidence that he is committed to all that he takes on is that from discussions with practitioners and advocates like yourself from across the country, he was interested in putting together a national convening on this issue, and here we all are today, in partnership with the Administration on Aging and the National Center for Lesbian Rights. It's my honor in welcoming Assistant Secretary Dr. Rafael Bostic. Thank you, Mina. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's very good to, to finally be here. Um, as Mina said, I've logged many miles around the country uh, talking about a number of issues, and one thing that's come up repeatedly is the issue of LGBT elders and the challenges they face. And hearing it again and again and again, sometimes it actually starts to get through to the brain that we need to talk about this and convene and, and really get the disparate folks, a lot of people from all over the country to talk about this stuff uh, in one place and in a unified way. And, and my hope is that through today, um, the, the community that we have been virtually becomes a community that we uh, get accustomed to seeing in person on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm very excited about today. You know, just listening to the din before we have actually started made clear that there's a lot to cover, there's a lot to talk about, and I definitely want to make sure that we get to all of that. So I want to thank you all for coming here and uh, being part of the first ever national convening on LGBT elder housing and long-term care issues. Uh, we are, thank you, yes. We are so proud and so excited to have this here and uh, this is truly historic. LGBT elders have vulnerabilities that can put them uh, and their access to quality housing and to long-term care uh, at significant risk. Um, the report, Improving the Lives of LGBT Older Adults, has found that LGBT elders are twice as likely to be single and three to four times more likely to age without the benefits of a partner and or children and other family supports as compared to others. And then there's also the ever-present issue of discrimination, both real and perceived. LGBT elders can, in some cases, be denied housing, including retirement and other long-term care housing set, uh, uh, settings based simply on their sexual orientation or gender identity. And even where discrimination is not overt, uh, LGBT elders can still feel unwelcome in their community. And in both cases, uh, they can be forced into hostile living environments or even homelessness. And this is why it's so important that we're all here today to discuss existing challenges as well as explore future policies for promoting current efforts to support housing and long-term long care designed for LGBT elders. And we have a full day's worth of programming here. And we're gonna start with a panel that covers the facts so that we all have a shared understanding about the state of play in this area. Then we have a panel that will cover uh, existing services that are available for this population, 
And after that, we'll talk, we have two panels actually, that will cover uh, some of the challenges and barriers that we face and that we see today in terms of serving that population. We'll finish up the day by turning to housing, specifically. And we'll have a couple of panels focused on the potential for various models of LGBT elder housing and uh, some of the successes and actually cautionary tales as well. This stuff is hard to do. Uh, and it's important that we enter into this with our eyes wide open. And then we have a, a, a great privilege uh, that we have a keynote speaker today um, over lunch, my colleague and friend, Mr. John Trasvinia. He is the Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity here in the department. And if you've not heard John talk on these issues, he is a champion. He is out front and in his belief that it is important that uh, we have a society in America that's open and available and productive for all Americans. And uh, LGBT populations are quite important for that. So it'll be a treat to have him talk at lunch and I'm hopeful that you will uh, enjoy him as much as I, I always do. So it's a good program. It's a really good program. And I wanna thank everyone who's been involved in putting this together. Um, this is a joint effort. We've been working with the US Department of Health and Human Services, the Administration on Aging, and the National Center for Lesbian Rights. I want to specifically call out Assistant Secretary Kathy Greenlee, who you'll hear from later today, and Greg Case from AOA. Um, most of you know Greg. He is outstanding, and it made it very easy for us to put this together. And I want to, again, thank you personally. I also want to thank Maya Rupert from NCLR. She has been truly wonderful as well. Uh, as soon as there was a hint that we might have this event, Maya was sending us emails and calling us and making sure that we had all the right people in the mix. And uh, so Maya, thank you as well for uh, your great work on our behalf. This, this summit really couldn't help without you either. And you know, we're at HUD, so I definitely have to call out my own folks. Uh, and I wanna in particular thank um, Rochelle Levitt, Claire Yerke, and Phyllis Manigo. Um, all the stuff you see today in terms of the materials and the, the, the panel stuff and all that, they do this. And uh, in the time that I've been here, we have seen a tremendous upgrade in terms of the, the quality of our programs, both in terms of the content, but how they deliver and how they flow. And it's a tribute to, to my staff there. So thank you. And uh, the person who deserves the most thanks from my side is Mina Bavan. Um, when I came to Mina and said, we're gonna have a summit, uh, she gave me a look. Uh, and then she said, okay, let's do it. And uh, has really dropped everything to make this happen and really make this uh, the day that it's going to be, which is gonna be outstanding. So Mina, thank you very much, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> and last but not least, I wanna thank all of you. I wanna thank all of you for being here to help us make history because uh, when we look back on this 10 years from now, 15 from years from now, there are gonna be a bunch of things that have happened in this area and will, it will have started today. And that is a huge uh, recognition and it's something that we all should carry with us as we move forward. This is uh, truly, truly exciting. Um, there's a lot that we can accomplish, but with it comes a lot of responsibility. So I get nervous also when we, when we get here because there's a lot to do. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with you to do it. And I also finally want to thank those of you who are tuning in via the webcast. Now, if you've ever seen me talk, you know, I don't do technology very well. Uh, I have something we call the curse. Computers break down all the time. You see, I'm not doing slides, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, I have staff, fortunately, who can capitalize on our existing technology. So we, we are live streaming this. This is out in the world and in the virtual space. And I want to welcome everyone who is participating that way. If you're on the web um, and you want to uh, weigh in, I encourage you to participate by emailing your questions uh, or comments that you might have to lgbtelderhousing at hud.gov. That's lgbtelderhousing at hud.gov. And you can follow the conversation at Twitter. I, and I don't know how to tweet. There are people here who do this for me. Um, at uh, hashtag lgbthousing. So um, we're trying to make this a worldwide event, and certainly uh, the issues uh, are real 
in all parts of our country, in all corners, and we want to make sure that everyone has access to this as much as possible. So I want to thank you for all for coming. Um, I'm going to stop talking and get us to the program itself. The program is really exciting, and um, what I'm hopeful for is that this isn't just a day of talking heads, but rather a day of conversation and discussion. So, you know, we have the mic set up uh, out there in the audience. Uh, I am trusting that uh, this crowd will not uh, hesitate to get up and speak and weigh in. So, um, this is really great. It's so wonderful to see everyone, and uh, let's get the day going. Um, so to start, I'm going to ask Jane Lincoln to come up and uh, get us uh, started with our facts. Jane? Thank you and good morning everyone. I'm Jane Lincoln. I work in the national office at AARP. I'm a health educator by day and a subversive lesbian by every other minute. Um, I am so pleased to be here. Those of us who work in straight world just feel like we're on a picnic or something when we get to hang out with our people. Um, I want to introduce two people who do not need an introduction, but it always bears to repeat their accomplishments. And I'm going to start with Michael Adams, who's on his way up. Michael Adams is the Executive Director of SAGE, Services and Advocacy for GLBT Elders. Located in New York, SAGE is the oldest and largest organization in the country, providing services and advocacy for LGBT seniors. SAGE's programs directly serve thousands of LGBT older people each month and engages in advocacy around LGBT aging issues in New York and across the country. In 2005, SAGE became the first official LGBT delegate to the Diennial Witness uh, White House Conference on Aging. In 2008, SAGE will celebrate its 30th anniversary and will present its fourth national conference on LGBT aging. If you can get through LGBT, everything else is gravy, right? Okay. Prior to joining SAGE, Michael was the Director of Education and Public Affairs for Lambda Legal overseeing all of Lambda Legal's community education, communications, outreach programs nationally. Trained as an attorney, Michael spent a decade leading cutting edge litigation that established new rights for LGBT people, first as associate director of the ACLU's Lesbian and Gay Rights Project, and then as deputy legal director at Lambda Legal. A graduate of Stanford Law School and Harvard College, Michael has authored numerous publications on an array of LGBT issues. He has taught seminars on sexual orientation and the law and serves on advisory councils for AARP, American Society on Aging, and the New York City Department for the Aging. Michael has discussed and debated LGBT issues on hundreds of media programs, including Larry King Live, Hannity and Combs, and NPR's Morning Edition. He was named one of the 100 most influential gay men and lesbians by Out Magazine. Please welcome Michael Adams. And then there's Mara Kiesling. Mara is the founding executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Mara is a transgender identified woman and a parent. As one of the nation's leading voices for transgender equality, Mara has a appeared on news outlets such as CNN and C-SPAN and is regularly quoted in the New York Times, The Post, and hundreds of other national and local print and electronic media. Since the National Center for Transgender Equality was founded in 2003, the organization was part of coalition efforts that have won significant advances in trans equality, such as the passage of the first ever transgender inclusive federal legislation, modification of the State Department rules for changing gender marker markers on passports, and the historic first con congressional hearing on transgender issues. Mara is a graduate of Penn State University and did her graduate work at Harvard University in American government. She's a founding board member of the Stonewall Democracy Fund and has served on the board of directors of Common Roads, an LGBTQ youth group, and on the steering committee of the statewide Pennsylvania Rights Coalition. 
Mara has almost 25 years of professional experience in social marketing and opinion research. Please welcome Mara. Thank you, Jane. Um, I think I am going to start. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be sharing this, um, this panel with, uh, with Mara. Um, so um, we thought it was important to provide a, a context for this conversation about LGBT older adults and housing so that we have a, a shared understanding of the, of the circumstances that shape the particularized needs of LGBT older adults with regard to housing and supportive services and housing. You know, we know that housing is a challenge for older adults in general, but in Sage's experience, it is a particularly acute challenge for LGBT older adults. Um, so we want to um, talk a little bit about, about why that is. Um, let's see if I can make this. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's that one, right? You should get Assistant Secretary Bostic to run it. He's, he's, he's good with technology, oh, it I understand. It happened. Okay, great. Um, so just, just, um, just briefly, and, and, and this is information I think is quite familiar to, um, to many folks, perhaps less familiar to other folks. As, as Assistant Secretary um, Bostic um, highlighted, we know that in general LGBT older folks um, face particular challenges. And, and, and we, could, we can lump those challenges into three general areas in terms of, of stigma, uh, in terms of being disconnected from traditional family structures, and in terms of um, unequal treatment under the law. What all, of those, what, what all of those factors build toward is, in many cases, um, particularly heightened sense of an experience of isolation among LGBT older people. Um, which heightens the importance of community and place. So for, for LGBT elders, it's fair to say that, that welcoming and supportive housing is, is not just a luxury, it's in fact a necessity. And it goes beyond the particulars of housing and a roof over one's head into what's important in terms of providing community for many people who, as they age, are, are really uh, are, find that in very, in very short supply. We need to be aiming at something. At what? Oh, no, it's just, it just slower, I think. Oh, it's slow. It's slower than I am. Okay. Um, so so we, um, what we know, if, if, we, if we drill a little more deeply, uh, what we know is that, is that financial insecurity among LGBT older people makes housing challenges, in fact, more difficult to resolve for LGBT older people. And just a, a couple of examples of that um, are, you know, if we know that recent data indicates that poverty levels are, in fact, higher among LGBT older people. The data that, that is available um, is limited, but, and is specific to couples, but what we see is that, is that older gay couples, older male couples are slightly more likely to be living in poverty than couples in general, but older lesbian couples, in fact, are substantially more likely, twice as likely, to be living in poverty as, as, as older couples in general. This has significant implications in terms of the resources that are available for LGBT older people to apply to address housing issues. We also see a very, very similar uh, trend when it comes to the availability of disposable income among LGBT older people. Here again, we see that the slide indicates that the annual Social Security income, the average for an older heterosexual couple, is just over $17,000 a year. That's small enough as it is, but if you look at that figure for older gay couples, it drops down to just over $14,000 a year. And if you look at it for older lesbian couples, it drops down to less than $12,000 a year. 
So we're talking about diminished assets um, and diminished disposable income to, to apply to determine, um, to determine housing needs. There also are an array of other financial disparities that, um, that prevent challenges for LGBT older people, including uh, problems with uh, long-term care through Medicaid and spousal impoverishment, which we fortunately are making progress on thanks to uh, a, a recent uh, breakthrough with the Center of Medicaid Services, um, retiree health insurance benefits and discrimination in those benefits, unequal treatment and tax qualified retirement plans and pensions and veterans benefits, and unequal treatment in inheritance laws. All of these together contribute to a, a really serious level of financial insecurity among LGBT older people. Um, but it's not limited, the challenges are not limited to, to financial insecurity. They exist as well um, with, regard to, um, with, to, with regard to health and health security. And now I don't know how to, it was working. What is it supposed to be pointing at? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Um, the, this is partly because of health disparities um, that LGBT older people face, which increase the need for housing models that incorporate health-related services like NORCs. Um, and it's for a variety of other reasons as well. What we, what we know in our experience and in the available research, for example, is that because of fears of discrimination and fears of culturally incompetent treatment, that LGBT older people are much more likely to, uh, to delay uh, uh, accessing health care or not seek health care uh, services at all. We also know that, the, um, that neglect uh, on the part of caregivers is a significant challenge with regard for LGBT older people, the, which makes both of these make the availability of, of health services and care that's close to home, and ideally that's actually linked to home and linked to housing, a, um, an important, uh, an important uh, option that should be available to LGBT older people. And the story goes on. If we look at the um, at, at, at supportive services and the lack thereof, supportive services and housing are particularly important for LGBT older people because they have such a hard time accessing them in general. Um, and what we see in our experience is that very often LGBT older adults find that they are not welcome in so-called mainstream aging programs. They cannot find either the services that they need that are tailored to their particular circumstances. They cannot find a welcome social, social environment. And so they don't have the sense of community that often comes with group-based social services. We also know, unfortunately, that even within the LGBT community itself, um, older people often feel isolated and don't find the sense of community that they need, which here again opens up important questions and themes about the importance of housing and the nature of housing and the need for housing for LGBT older folks to provide both services and a sense of, and a sense of community. So this is, you know, broadly speaking, these are some of the overarching issues and overarching circumstances that are important to understand as we think and talk over the course of the day about LGBT older adults and housing. Thank you so much, Michael. Hello, everyone. I'm Mara Kiesling, and I'm a stander and a pacer, so I hope that's OK. Um, what I am not is a PowerPoint person. You're lucky. I know. Well, I'll tell you, your, your, oops, your PowerPoint uh, presentation makes me want to be a PowerPoint person because it was really pretty cool Thank you. Um, and had great <laughs> icons, but I, I tend not to be a PowerPoint person. So uh, thank you. And I think Michael um, summed it up really well and, and talked a lot about what is faced, in fact, by gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender um, seniors um, in a housing context. What I'm here to do is really to talk about the, the, the transgender part of that and how, how there are some differences. Um, I think everything that Michael said applies very well to transgender people, but there are some, um, some tricks to the system that we just wanted to uh, make sure we covered. Um, so yes, we still face the stigmatization, we still face the discrimination, um, we have often um, different support structures than non-LGBT people. But it's really important to understand that, that what, is, what works for gay people doesn't always work for trans people enough. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about um, 
the trans part of that and how we're um, a little bit different. Um, so until very recently, 63.2% of all statistics about transgender people were made up, <laughs> including that one. Um, but there have been more and more um, studies over the last couple of years, and we're now really starting to get some, some good data. And you saw Michael had some good data on transgender people. You're going to hear from Larry Cook Daniels later on some, some good data. Um, but the Caring with Aging and Pride survey really gave us some, some good meaningful uh, demographic data for trans people for the first time. And it's a sample of 174 trans people uh, age 50 and over. But what we see in it is that trans people are very diverse, and that's really important to keep in mind. We're diverse demographically in all the different aspects of demographics. We're diverse economically. Um, very importantly, we have diverse sexual orientations. Some trans people identify as gay, some identify as straight, some identify as bisexual, some identify as queer. Uh, and, and that plays into it when programs are being developed um, for LGBT people, because sometimes transgender people may identify as straight and may not feel they fit quite in, or may not um, fit in. Um, uh, and then there's lots of different types of transgender people. Uh, there are people who um, are transsexuals and people who are just very gender non-conforming. There are people who are just cross, I don't mean just in a derogatory way, who, who are um, in a narrow sense defined as transsexual or cross-dresser or, or gender non-conforming. Um, and the length of outness. Right now we're going through a societal thing where a lot of folks um, like me, middle-aged people, have come out as transgender and have transitioned. But a lot, of transition, a lot of transgender people have transitioned very, very young in life, um, and that will be more and more true. Uh, a lot of tr transgender seniors have yet to transition and will be transitioning in existing um, housing or programs. Um, so it's, it's very important to understand how diverse we are. Um, a, a really important part of this, as Michael touched on, are the structural barriers to health care that um, all LGBT people face, and there's some particular ones that transgender people face. Um, one, it's, it has heretofore been very hard for trans people to access non-employer um, provided health insurance. So transgender people who are pre-Medicare um, qualified um, very often are unable to, to be insured, um, and that's uh, an important thing to keep in mind. Um, second, when they are insured, uh, currently there's a very, very good chance that transition-related health care, um, the, the health treatments and, and um, such that they would need to access for transition are generally denied by health insurance carriers, um, uh, some, including Medicaid, or sorry, Medicare, which uh, exclude surgery, but other types of transition-related care are covered by Medicare. Um, and, and as Michael pointed out, which is really, really important, delay of care, uh, trans people tend to delay care very much, not just preventive care, but acute care as well. Um, and we have no reason to think that's not true of, of transgender se seniors. One of the overall contextual things for trans people is who determines our gender when we're in institutional contexts. And this is really, really important because a large part of being transgender is your gender and your self-identity of your gender. And that's a really core part of your self-identity. And if you're in an institutional setting where other people are making those choices for you, that can be really, really difficult. It can be very traumatic. Um, and, and I want to point out, it isn't just what gets marked down on your records, though that's really important. It's how you're treated, which programs you're, you're involved or allowed to participate in, um, how people welcome you at the front desk, what happens when you fill out the forms to, to get housing or to get types of programs. So how people are interpreting your gender and um, policing your gender is really, really important. And that goes through the whole range of things in a housing context, which facilities you're allowed to use, who are your roommates going to be if it's a roommate context. Um, who are you permitted to have relationships with? Um, and then one of the, the most um, insipid problems that we face is, is something I call vicarious disrespect. And that is a lot of trans people are told, 
it's okay with me, but it won't be okay with them. You'll make them uncomfortable. You'll make them nervous. So therefore, we won't let you in that program. We won't let you in that facility. And that kind of vicarious disrespect is really hurtful. Um, importantly, identification documents, that's really hard. It's, it's a very difficult thing for trans people. It's becoming easier and easier to get them, but there's still some difficulties. And this impacts employment, which obviously impacts economics and everything else. But it also involves harassment at SSA offices, harassment at pharmacies when you have to show your Medicare card, which has your gender marker smack big in the middle of it. We do hope that CMS changes that soon. Um, but it also, when you discriminate, or I'm sorry, when you go to get housing, whether it's in an assisted living context or an apartment uh, in, in the private market, you're going to have to show your ID generally. And um, my colleague Harper Jean Tobin um, likens it when you had the wrong gender marker on your ID in those kind of contexts, to if you had to go in and show your driver's license and it had gay stamped on it. Um, it's it's a, a, a really troubling thing for trans people. Um, and it, it overall means, this ID problem means, you don't get to decide when and how to come out to whom. Um, and that's a really important thing. And then lastly, um, there's just a lot of heightened bias and victimization of trans people. Um, you know, according to the, the Caring and Aging with Pride survey, um, and I quote, trench and older adults are a critically underserved population at heightened risk of physical and mental health disparities, often com combined with less social and community support. Um, trans people tend to be at higher risk of poverty, disability, depression, loneliness, suicide ideation, um, and general poor health. Um, and, um, and trans people, it seems, and we feel, um, are experiencing both higher poverty and victimization as, as age goes on. Um, so again, we just wanted to point out there that trans people are different than gay people. A lot of overlap um, with the issues, and that's, that's really important too, but there's some extra considerations we'd like people to keep in mind. So thank you very much. Oh, and Michael, oh, I'm sorry, Jane. Or Michael, we were going to open for questions. Is that yes? This oh. is a great time. Okay. We have seven minutes for questions. So please come to the mic so that everyone can hear your question. Just fine. <laughs> <laughs> now you're all in trouble. <laughs> Um, thank you for your presentations, and also um, one of the things I think is important, and I'm, I'm oh, I'm Joy Silver, sorry. Joy Silver, um, Rainbow Vision Properties, Inc., and Ardent Senior Living. Uh, one of the questions I have that I think maybe we need to start to talk about, and particularly, Michael, because you brought up the whole concept of the health care services, and this has been a big concern of mine in addition to housing, the, the need for healthcare services is only going to rise. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is, are there any plans for dealing with the onslaught and the, the, the epidemic proportions of what, we're of what we're facing and going to face regarding Alzheimer's and dementia? Well, I, I think that, um, to, at least from my knowledge, to say that we have good plans um, for that would be an overstatement. I, we, we are starting, a, a number of us are starting to have conversations about the, uh, about the Affordable Care Act and how we hope that it is going to transform the, the delivery <coughs> of, um, of health care and health care services in this country and what that might mean and what opportunities it may open up for, um, for current and future service organizations in the country, including the uh, uh, increasing our capacity, actually, to focus in on um, those kinds of challenges that, is, as you say, Joy, are just going to become exponentially, um, you know, exponentially greater. Um, we also, but, but really, I think, you know, and, and you know this as, as well as anybody in this room, in terms of the LGBT aging field, our our resources and our bandwidth is so stretched relative to the challenges that we face that often we, um, we're attempting to tackle huge global issues very much in, in a localized way. Now, there are some benefits to that in terms of 
creating program models and using, um, and using local models for laboratories, but there are serious limitations to it in terms of how you translate that kind of local activity into more global solutions. And I think about that in particular with regard to Alzheimer's because I know in a couple of, of service programs that our organiza different organizations here are developing around the country, we're building partnerships, for example, with the Alzheimer's Association that can lead to tailored um, programs that would be useful for LGBT older folks. But the challenge is how do you take those really localized programs and build it to scale on a national level and we don't have an answer to that yet. And, and I hope that there are other folks that do, but I think that's a big, big problem for us. Hey, Gina. Hi, I'm Gina Petrochi. I'm the uh, CEO of Bailey House, which has um, been providing housing to people living with HIV and AIDS for, uh, since 1984. I've been there, I've been the CEO since 91. And I guess it's, it's kind of a question um, for the two of you and kind of a statement for the rest of us is, um, you know, walking in here, I realize there's going to be a lot of dittos because, you know, we talk in AIDS, we talk all about structural drivers now. Um, and everything we're going to end up talking about today is going to be about structural drivers, which keep people from staying home, from living in housing. Um, and there's so many similarities. And the models are out there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And I guess what I want to say to everybody here is, you know, one of the wonderful things about being gay, LGBT for all these years has been to really push the envelope um, and to really look beyond what's already available and think about really new innovation. Um, I think there's some opportunities with the Affordable Care Act, but I think as a, as a community, it would be great if we can think beyond what we have now. We've got supportive housing, and not for LGBT people necessarily, but the programs are all the same. Um, we can link Medicaid for case management with housing units. You know what? We've been doing that for a long time in different ways. Um, so I guess I want to, and I'm on a panel later, I want to encourage all of us to think about, you know, something else. So any ideas about that? <laughs> well, I don't want to steal the thunder of um, a later panel, <clears throat> but I would say um, I know that later on in the day, mm -hmm. There's going to be a panel that will include a discussion of um, SAGE's NORC program in Harlem. And for anybody who doesn't know what NORC stands for, it stands for Naturally Occurring Retirement Community. And I raise it as an example because as you'll hear later today, it's a great example mm -hmm. of taking an existing model and really blowing the walls out from it in terms mm -hmm. of applying it to an LGBT mm -hmm. um, context and a people of color community. And mm -hmm. There are numerous, I think, other examples in this room um, of how we can and need to be creative and innovative and expanding on existing models. So I think we're going to hear a fair amount about right. that over okay. the course of a day. Uh, I don't know if you want. To. Ditto. <laughs> um, but Ditto. but uh, you know I, I, you know sticking to I guess my theme and and yeah. my my hat at NCTE is we, we need to make sure that as these are being developed. Um, the, the transgender part of it yeah, I think it's, uh, is is either included or it isn't. Right. Um, right. Now I'm not advocating that it not be, but if we build mm -hmm. these these structures and processes and programs that are mm -hmm. um, gay perfect, um, mm -hmm. and, and they don't work for trans people, but they're presumed to work for trans people, mm -hmm. um, that's that's different than if we, we we just have to start figuring that out and and how trans people fit into that or if they fit into that. Right. Right, right, okay, thanks. Hello, I'm Karen Fredrickson Goldson, and one of the authors on the Aging and Health Report with Caring and Aging with Pride that Cara was. Um, thank you. And I just, um, I have executive summaries, so I'll distribute those. And I think one thing that is very important, and my question to all of you, well, one thing we found is that housing was the top priority um, across LGBT older adults. We also found significant disparities, but we also found key differences and diversity in terms of what the housing needs are. Mm -hmm. And they differ in terms of by the oldest old needing, needing in-home housing uh, support so that they can age in place. We also found among different racial and ethnic groups, different types of um, housing options, and we also found um, that some people really need, um, they, they would like to move into housing 
type, different types of housing, but also that others need, um, that would really prefer, again, as I said, to age in place. So I just want to keep in mind and ask all of you, how do you think we move forward in terms of developing housing options across these very diverse groups of people, both LGB and T, and bisexuals were also um, in need of housing options, but one of the most, um, also along, one of the, one of the groups with the most unmet needs. So my question to you is, how do we respond to the diversity of needs? Do you want to, do you want to start, or me to start it? Well, I can't say ditto if I start, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I think we have to try lots of different things, and I think what we're going to find is that things work well for some people and not well for other people, and, and that's why there's a diversity of choices now, and we need to keep that in mind, that there's probably not one solution, and if we have multiple solutions, I think they'll be more applicable to different types of people. I think that's one of the strengths of the agenda today is that there are, there, over the course of the day, there'll be an opportunity to look at a variety of different models and approaches. But what I would say is that the, the point that you're raising, Karen, is a point not just with, with regard to housing, and as you know well, it is with regard to programs and services in LGBT aging and in aging in general. So often we can find ourselves getting caught up in a 60 and up type of conversation or 50 and up, when of course there are vast differences in those, and that's just with regard to age range, never mind with regard to life experience, with differences based on race, based on gender, et cetera. And so this is a theme that we need to constantly be pushing, um, and not just in housing, but in our services and programs as well that if we think that we're just talking about one group um, because people are older, we're really completely missing the boat. So I appreciate your, your making that point. Great, thank you. We're out of time for questions, um, but I wanna mention two quick things before we go to a little break. One is that I'm just thinking of a project that Imani Woody is working on uh, with others. The DC AARP office is part of a coalition, uh, the Washington LGBT Aging Coalition, that's working on a seal of approval for LGBT friendly care across venues, and it's going to be presented at the ASA conference in March, so if any of you uh, aging freaks are going there, check that out. Also, I would be, I'm going to get spanked if I don't mention, aarp.org slash pride is our portal. We also won an award for our Stonewall coverage 40 years later at um, aarp.org slash Stonewall. Um, we are many. We are aging, but fabulously. And let's hear a round of applause for our fabulous panelists. Thank you. And thank you, Jane. Thank you. 15 minutes.
Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Laura Young, and I'm the Aging and Economic Security Director at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Um, at the task force, we're excited by the actions of HUD to expand equality by their recognition of our housing needs and definition of our families. 
The Administration on Aging has shown tremendous leadership as well to impact the lives of LGBT people as we age. And I want, before I get going, to give a special shout out to Assistant Secretary Bostic at HUD and Assistant Secretary Kathy Greenlee at the Administration on Aging for the incredible leadership that both of them have shown to pay attention and create new rules and regulations and guidance to impact the lives of LGBT elders. Now, both Mark Easling and Michael Adams spoke to you this morning about the reality of our lives. Uh, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force works to build political power of the LGBT community from the ground up in partnership with both SAGE, NCTE, and NCLR that was instrumental in putting today's summit together. We develop and disseminate important tools to help LGBT people, LGBT people <laughs> in uh, communities, states, across the country and at the federal level to build power, take action, and create change for aging LGBT people. The release of Outing Age 2010 is part of our partnership with SAGE, which was a follow-up to a groundbreaking report on LGBT aging and two other important tools I want to mention to you so that you get an idea of where you can go to use uh, tools for advocacy both at the state level and in your local communities. We published a guide called Finding the Federal Dollars You Deserve, a program to, that tracks every single dollar in the federal budget on aging programs and services and how to apply for those funds for community services. It identifies HUD programs that you can apply for direct funding for housing programs. It identifies whether for community-based services you need to go through your local AAA or your state unit on aging. So it's an, a really incredible user-friendly guide to the federal government's dollars for aging services. We published in 2010 a book called Our Maturing Movement, which was a state-by-state -state analysis of the intersections of LGBT anti-discrimination protections and aging anti-discrimination protections, again, in partnership with SAGE. The statewide advocates can use these policy recommendations formulated for each state what we did was look at the intersection state by state to see how those things interact or what are the holes that need to be plugged and develop specific recommendations for each state. And we hope that this tool will be invaluable as a guide. I have some copies of the tool here today. So today, we're going to talk about community-based services and programs that help people age in place. I think what you heard this morning is that LGBT people face inordinate challenges as we age. Financial health challenges and discrimination in access to housing and safe housing at being the, the primary consideration. So today I want to introduce to you our three speakers. And I'm going to introduce all of them and uh, they're fortunately sitting in order of how they're going to speak to you. Maya Chamberlain is the Director of Services for Seniors and Homeless Families at Friendly House in Portland, Oregon. Among her responsibilities there is Oversight for Gay and Gray, a program serving LGBT elders in the Portland metro area, and I believe uh, a pending or soon to be SAGE uh, affiliate. Announced, announced officially last week. There we oh, go. Yeah, SAGE Metro Portland. There we go. And we have with us, speaking next, will be Kathleen Sullivan, who has worked for 20 years as a campaign manager and consultant before deciding to enter a graduate school to study housing for LGBT seniors. She has a PhD in gerontology and serves as director of senior services of the LA Gay and Lesbian Center. And she's going to describe some of the center services for LGBT seniors. And finally, we have Hope Barrett, who is currently Senior Director of Public Programs at the Center on Halstead, where she provides leadership and direction for all aspects of the organization's public programs for older adults. And again, another SAGE affiliate in Chicago. And she's going to discuss, discuss with you today the kinds of services that uh, they provide at the Center on Halstead that really enable our community to age in place. We know that as we age, most people want to stay in their home. And many services are now geared to provide <coughs> the kind of support services. And especially if you're afraid to go into some kind of assisted living or nursing care, 
the community-based services are critical to help people meet their needs. So uh, we're going to start with Maya, and uh, we'll have time for questions and, and answers uh, as we wrap up. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. And I, I was just talking to Kathleen about how uh, earlier this summer I was at a meeting um, and had the privilege of, of hearing Assistant Secretary Bostic speak. And it was at that meeting he said, well, you know, maybe we need to do a summit on this issue. And um, I'm thinking about the pace with which the federal government sometimes moves. And in no part of my imagination did I think that we would be here six months later doing this. And I feel just so privileged to be a part of it. And so, um, and also I, I want to apologize ahead of time. I had so much to say and so little time to say it that I needed to write out my notes. And regrettably, I'm not as quick as some people. So I'll be reading them. But feel free to stop me or ask questions, I will. however. Not to worry. Thank you. <laughs> Keep you in line. Thanks. Someone needs to. Um, Friendly House is a nonprofit social service neighborhood center in the heart of Portland, Oregon. In addition to being a community center and gathering place for people from all walks of life, we offer three core service areas, um, adult recreation and education, children's programming, and then the program that I oversee, which is services for seniors and homeless families. Since 1978, Friendly House has carried a contract with our local area AAA to provide Older Americans Act programs and services to support seniors in staying independent and in their own homes to avoid transitioning to a higher level of care. It's always been a mandate of that contract to provide an out enhanced outreach to vulnerable elder populations defined as low income, racial and ethnic minorities, frail individuals, limited English proficiency, and so on, with no mention of LGBT populations. In 2000, a group of, uh, comprised of AAA leadership, um, elders in our community, Friendly House staff, and members of the community at large convened to discuss ways of bringing needed services and opportunities to this population in a way that was respectful of the fears and concerns that they were rightfully experiencing. Thus, Gay and Gray was born. In its early days, Gay and Gray focused on developing a rich array of activities that offered recreation and socialization opportunities in an effort to reduce the isolation and depression that often befalls older LGBT adults. It was also the intention that the activities would warm people to Friendly House, an opportunity for this cohort to see for themselves that while our organization does not exclusively serve LGBT people, we were committed to providing opportunities exclusively for them and that we are a welcoming, safe place for them to seek services without fear of discrimination. For 10 years, we've been pounding away at leadership to impress upon them that LGBT elders are, in fact, a vulnerable senior, senior constituency who require focused attention and funding to be appropriately served. I'm thrilled to report that just weeks ago, we learned that our local AAA will be broadening the definition of vulnerable populations to include LGBT elders, and have asked us to submit, an RF, uh, to submit a response to an RFPQ to provide culturally specific programming for this cohort. If we're successful, it will be the first government funding we've received for this program. Um, over the years, we've heard murmurings that this program should have been developed in an organization that exclusively serves LGBT, the LGBT community. But overwhelmingly, the feedback from our seniors is that because we offer programs to people of all ages, backgrounds, income, that walking into our doors offers them some anonymity that they wouldn't have in a traditional LGBT setting. Um, in 2001, we launched our diversity trainings, which won us acclaim both locally and nationally. The heart of our training is the Elder Panel, a group of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender elders who give their time to share their deeply heartfelt stories. We have a speakers bureau of over 15 panelists that we call on to speak to different issues to different audiences. To the extent that we're able, we'll select speakers whose stories reflect the educational needs of the audience that we're, that we're training. One example would be that when we're speaking to nursing students, our panel's focused on issues that they've had in the medical community. Um, speaking to housing providers, they're addressing housing-related experiences. Several colleges and universities have built the diversity training into their curriculum for nursing and social work students in particular. We were approached by Dr. Anissa Rogers, the chair of the Social Behavioral Sciences Department at University of Portland, a Catholic university that has been hosting the training for over 10 years. 
Dr. Rogers was interested in doing a research project based on the data we've been collecting from training participant surveys since 2007. Her team has compiled and analyzed the data and preliminary results show that of the 600 plus respondents, over 93% found the training excellent or very good and 91% said that the elder panel was the most compelling component and it changed how they will work with LGBT people in their future careers. The full results of her findings are going to be shared at a national social work conference that's actually happening here in Washington, D.C. in January. Dr. Rogers also shared with us that since she's been offering the training for her students, a handful have actually changed the course of their studies to focus on the mental health needs of this community. In fact, Dr. Rogers herself uh, told us just the other day that she's going to be taking a sabbatical next summer to go to the Kinsey Institute where she will research sexuality and LGBT elders as a result of her exposure of the panel. <clears throat> Since the trainings, we facilitated um, about 25 trainings a year and have reached thousands of students and professionals. In the last two years, we've refocused our efforts to uh, gear the trainings more towards housing providers. Providence Elder Place has been a really important partner in this effort. Providence Elder Place employs the PACE model of service delivery and has five communities locally that support both private pay and Medicaid elders by providing housing, on-site medical care, social engagement. Um, and Elder Place has had all of their staff receive their training from their highest level administration staff to their doctors, nurses, caregiving staff, and more recently um, are having the residents of their facilities participate in the training. The resident trainings are a critical component of creating a welcoming environment for LGBT older adults. And we're doing more of the resident trainings through our housing assessment program, which I'll be speaking more to a little bit later. Um, as a result of our recent affiliation with SAGE, formalized, that was said I think just last week, um, we were able to have our gay and gray coordinator trained in their amazing curriculum, which gives us a whole nother tool to use in educating our community on the strengths and challenges of this vulnerable population. In 2010, Gay and Gray adopted a fellow nonprofit in our area called SHARE, and it's an acronym, Senior Housing and Retirement Enterprises. SHARE started at about the same time as Gay and Gray back in early 2000, 2001, and while we were focusing on education, in-home services, case management, and activities, SHARE was focused on the mission of building LGBT housing. Um, they later modified their mission to, to include identifying gay-friendly housing options. When they approached us to ask if we would be willing to carry on their mission through Gay and Gray, we enthusiastically agreed. Two minutes? <laughs> oh, my goodness, time goes. Okay. Um, I'm skipping stuff. I want to talk a little bit about um, the housing assessment uh, our, we have an advisory team that focuses specifically on issues of housing, and they have developed this housing assessment tool where we're, we will be working with long-term care providers, assisted living, um, adult care homes, um, hospice, to help get them ready to embrace this population in their communities. Um, Creating the assessment tool was challenging, and rather than looking at amenities or cost or location, we were developing an assessment tool to evaluate a feeling and sense about an environment while making the assessment as objective as possible. Um, uh, let's see here. The assessment tool is evaluating more than just these, these objective factors. Their non-discrimination policies, their, does their insurance cover domestic partners, how do they handle peer conflict and discrimination, do they receive cultural competency training, um, are some of the things that we're looking at in our assessment tool. We've just begun piloting this program and the initial response has been outstanding. We have another number of local long-term care facilities who are ready to start um, working with us and are helping us and refine our process as well. By design, the process is open, transparent, negotiable, and flexible. We understand that all communities have different cultures, barriers, and attributes, but as long as we are all working towards the goal of shared, respectful communities, we're making progress. We hope to create long-lasting partnerships in the community with these businesses that are invested in serving this population as we are. It is not intended to be a punitive, pro punitive process that dings facilities for non-compliance. Um, instead, we want to be a resource to these, to these 
communities so that they can see the benefits of welcoming all communities in their settings. That is a perfect summary statement. <laughs> I winged it. You certainly did. Thank you so much, Thanks. Maya. And now uh, Kathleen is going to talk to us about the programs in Los Angeles. So my name is Kathleen Sullivan again. I'm the Director of Senior Services at the LA Gay and Lesbian Center. Um, the center just celebrated its 40th anniversary. Um, we have programs uh, for youth. We have a clinic, uh, cultural arts, HIV prevention, and senior services. We're um, sort of the up and coming department within this lar much larger organization. And uh, we're supported uh, a couple of years ago by the Administration on Aging in their Community Innovations and Aging in Place grant. And right now, our programming is really divided into three large chunks. Um, we have enrichment programming. We offer about 80 different uh, activities for seniors each month, most of them at one of our facilities called The Village at Ed Gould Plaza, which is kind of has a campus feel to it. Um, and I did leave um, outside where the, uh, the posters are. There are some uh, examples, and please feel free to take one, of our senior newsletter that we put out each month. Uh, the enrichment programming is really to um, bolster the social support networks of LGBT seniors in the greater Los Angeles area, um, as well as to reduce their isolation. Um, one thing that we know in Los Angeles is that uh, between 64 to 75 percent of seniors live alone, and that type of isolation uh, can be rather detrimental to them, both for their mental health but also for their physical health. Um, and so offering an open, affirming, supportive environment for people to actually be engaged and continue to learn and grow is very important to us. Uh, the other aspect that uh, is part of our uh, program is actually training providers, so similar to uh, what Mai was talking about. And I actually have gone through the Rainbow Train years ago uh, when I was a Portland resident, and it is fantastic to have the panels. Uh, we train um, both small providers uh, who provide in-home care, um, but also have started training um, county workers as well. We just trained Aging Protective Services of Orange County, which was a great opportunity. And now we're going to be uh, actually training next month the Aging Disability Services of Orange County as well, um, but also work within uh, the city of Los Angeles. And the idea is that we can't obviously provide the services for every senior in Los Angeles. Um, you know, depending on what um, side you come down on in terms of the size of the population of LGBT seniors in LA, it's between 19,000 and 89,000 LGBT seniors uh, within the county of Los Angeles. Clearly, we do not have the capacity to provide services for all of those people. So we, similar to what um, Mai is doing, uh, in Portland, and probably what Hope is doing too, uh, what many of us are doing, is to work with people who are already providing services so that they can learn how to create open and accepting communities. And uh, we just trained our 800th per person uh, at a small uh, board and care facility, actually, in, uh, in Sherman Oaks last week. Um, and then the uh, third part of the program in our, our program and what I've been asked to talk a little bit more about um, is our case management. Oh, thank you. You're right. Let's see. <laughs> I might have to call Michael. Oh, oh my God. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the th third part of this program is uh, our case management um, program. So we have two case managers on staff that are providing what we call short-term case management services. And uh, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Karen who said the number one thing that people said in the survey was that they need uh, housing. Well, that's definitely true of what we find within our case management services as well. Housing is the number one need uh, for seniors that come into our program. Uh, I also always put this out that in California, the other great need is food insecurity. Um, because seniors who are on SSI, so these are our poorest seniors in California, are not eligible for food stamps because each month the state of California gives them $24 as part of their food allowance. Uh, so we have a great need for, um, uh, for support in terms of uh, getting people enough food, quality food to eat each month. Um, 
uh, case management. Um, like I said, housing is the big um, piece. We also um, are able to uh, refer people out, both to services within our own organization, which is incredibly helpful. Um, once people come into uh, their, the case management meeting or within our office, um, getting referred within the organization feels very easy to them. And we know the simpler we make um, uh, access to care for people, uh, the quicker they can get into care, the more likely they are to actually access it. Uh, so that's a huge piece of our, um, of our programming. It's just the internal uh, referrals we can make to our mental health department. And now our clinic is actually starting to offer, uh, and we'll have, we still have to figure this out now with uh, the changes with the Affordable Health Care Act and um, the enrollment within Medicare and then the changes to um, dual beneficiaries. But we're starting to offer health care as well uh, to seniors. Uh, the external referrals come from uh, the work that we do with the training we provide. Um, we not only go out and do the training, uh, we have a pretty extensive um, interview and uh, questionnaire process and then follow up so that anyone who wants to stay on our referral list to have seniors referred to them for services needs to basically get a refresher course um, each, each year. And I think that one thing that we would benefit from, so I'm interested in talking to you and others, is um, just uh, the, the ongoing training of other providers and the ongoing, you know, us keeping in touch with them to make sure that, um, that they are continuing to provide an opening and welcoming uh, community. What we have found with um, our seniors is that there does seem to be a higher rate of depression. We think a lot of that is based on isolation, um, but we think a lot of that is also based on the chronic stress that they're older, they're more vulnerable, and they're LGBT. And so uh, they're making decisions, as we tell people that we're training, at every point uh, as to whether or not to come out and uh, be authentic about who they are and be truthful to providers of care. And that causes an enormous amount of stress for our seniors. Uh, we have a story outside of one senior, Betty, is what we called her. Um, but, you know, we have a senior who, uh, I'm not going to talk about her, I'm going to talk about someone else, I'll call him Steve. Uh, he was really integral to um, the center and to the senior program. And as his health has started to diminish, he actually, although he was very involved with us, has started to isolate himself. And so we need to uh, actually call him, have other seniors call him. But I think that it just goes to show that, uh, you know, he's starting to, even though he was an incredibly out man, he's been in advertisements, he still feels vulnerable um, accessing care. And that's a huge problem. And so we're trying to negotiate that with him now. Um, so the chronic stress, I think, is something that, uh, that people deal with and actually is a contributor to their depression and isolation. We also have seniors who have long-term mental health problems that we're not necessarily going to solve. Um, we do have a mental health department that works uh, with our seniors, and they can get free or at or low cost. And when I say low cost, two to five dollars a session um, with a, a psychotherapist or a uh, uh, licensed social worker. What is that? Lice Thanks. Thank you. I'm really bad at that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> which is also psychotherapy. Thank you, Richard. Um, but we have seen comorbidities, um, which you all know, between mental health and physical ailments, as well as chronic disease and uh, prolonging the time before one accesses care. Um, uh, the new um, sort of place where we're going is providing this level of care. We want to create wraparound services um, for our seniors, similar to what we do with our youth service program. And we're moving into um, creating affordable housing that has sort of a semi-supportive structure so that we can have our case management, mental health facilities, and then a clinic within the building where the seniors will be living. And then on top of that, link it to all of the enrichment programming that we have ongoing right now so that people have a plethora of opportunities to, uh, to remain healthy and age in place for as long as possible. Um, and I'm just going to give a shout out to Nancy, who I just met, um, Nancy Bernstein, who, uh, you know, we were just talking about how common, it's common sense to all of us that we have to have services in our housing. 
um, because that just helps people uh, long term, particularly with the population that we're going to be working with and we do work with in affordable housing. Um, and so that's why we're very serious about continuing the services into the housing model as we create. And now it's on. And uh, now it's going to be hope. We are throughout today going to be talking about barriers to affordable housing, models that have been developed. And so this is the beginning of that conversation, and it will go on throughout the day. Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Again, my name is Hope Barrett. I'm with the Center on Halstead in Chicago. Center on Halstead is the largest LGBT community center in the Midwest. And like my colleagues here, we provide an array of services for the LGBT community, including services for older adults. We provide um, uh, also services for youth, uh, we have a mental health department, we do HIV prevention, so we have a, a, a really holistic approach to providing care for our community. So as has been noted before, we are an affiliate of SAGE. Uh, I think SAGE is up to now 20 odd affiliates and, and, and growing, so. Or, or even. <laughs> <laughs> um, and welcome Maya to, to the group. Um, Center and Halstead uh, has been around for close to 30 years. So, and there's been a strong program for older adults that has gone through some evolution over the years. We've been at Center and Halstead since 2006 as Sage Center and Halstead. So just a little clarification there. And we have a wellness model of care. So we try to um, engage older adults, 55 and up, um, in social activities, cultural, intellectual, occupational, spiritual, emotional, and physical. So we try to provide services that hit all of those um, areas. We currently offer um, what I would say are our core programs. We also do uh, referrals to outside uh, sources as well. But our core programs include a congregate meal program. We provide uh, hot meals twice per week and a box lunch once per week for upwards of 200 seniors. Uh, it's, it's very, very... Um, Amazing, and I have to give a shout out to Serena whenever I'm in um, spaces like this because Serena was my predecessor and really laid the foundation for an amazing program, and we're trying to just build on that. In addition to the congregate uh, meal program, which really serves as a portal to access other services, and folks have already talked about isolation, depression. I mean, all of those things um, we see as well. And so the Congregate Meal Program draws people in, and then we try to engage them in other activities. We have educational activities. We have wellness activities. We do yoga, stretch and stroll. Um, we have a friendly visitor program where we match uh, a trained volunteer who commits to weekly visits with an isolated or homebound LGBT senior. We also have a home sharing program that was launched last year, and we're very, very excited about this program because we're talking about different models that came up because we know that one size will not fit all, and so we have to come up with different options for folks. And this option, I think, will really help folks to age in place. We match older adults who are homeowners with well-screened, qualified renters. We try to, and, and the program has been in existence for just over a year, so we, we're kind of tweaking and um, adjusting as we go along. So initially we thought, okay, we would match much older adults 
75, 80 with younger adults. And the younger folks would sort of help out with household chores, um, take out the garbage, um, maybe help with taking folks to doctor visits, that kind of stuff. What we've seen, though, is that we're getting much younger people, both as homeowners and renters. It could just be, um, it could be a whole host of reasons, maybe marketing, we're not hitting the older people um, as yet. But we're very excited, we've matched five folks so far, we have five in the hopper, and we see this really as a win-win situation. So the renter gets to uh, live in a highly desirable neighborhood, lovely home, and the provider gets um, not only companionship, but assistance with the rent or mortgage. So we think that this is a, a really good model. And home sharing has been around for lots and lots of years, but it's a model that we're trying to use with our LGBT older adults. We also have an information and referral program, which I won't go into because we know what that means. Um, we have a constituent advocacy program where we train LGBT older adults to be advocates for their issues. So they actually go out and do the training or education for policymakers providers or other um, older adults. And we've been incredibly you know, successful with, I think we have about 12 advocates now who have given testimony, who have provided training for providers. And, and so we're very, very uh, thrilled to have that program. On the horizon, affordable housing. So Center on Halstead is partnering with Heartland Alliance for Human Needs and Human Rights, and they've been around for a gazillion years. And they also provide a wide array of uh, social services in Chicago. One of their big service units is, is, is housing. We are partnering with them to create housing for seniors 55 and up, low to moderate income seniors. We're looking at approximately 75 units. And this will be, initially the grand plan was to, it's amazing how, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I will not, you know, I will have time left over, now I'm getting that. <laughs> but, um, Nobody has time left But over. the center on Halstead, and I think there's a picture, uh, there's a model mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of, of the unit. So center on Halstead is just a little bit uh, north of the proposed uh, housing. And initially, there was going to be a bridge to the center, but I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> the, there's a police, it's an old police station, and it's like the oldest police station in the nation. And the police have a driveway that they're not about to give up. And so we can't build that bridge. Can you imagine? Yeah. It would have been um, wonderful. But folks will have, hopefully, easy access to uh, Center and Halstead and all the services that we, we talked about because it's so critical. It's not just about providing housing for folks, uh, but a, a, a community and supportive housing. Um, and we have mental health. And we would love, love to expand the current services that we offer. Unlike you, we don't even have a case manager. So my staff, they do case management. Um, although, you know, technically they're not case managers. So Center and Halstead will assist in the property management as well as the development and implement, implementation of social service and community programs. Construction is scheduled for next year. We're hoping to break ground next year. And um, I think with the, a grand opening, hopefully in 2014 or 2015, we have funding by a whole host of folks, which I won't go into. I'm certainly open to questions that you all may have, but Thank that's you. the plan. Thanks, Hope.
I, I think you've heard from our, can we give our round of applause? I think what you were able to hear this morning is that people are working in local communities uh, to provide critical services to help uh, older LGBT people age in place. Also to provide some creative, affordable housing. I think the, the critical thing, we, if you wrap together what Mara and Michael talked about this morning and you talk about the financial challenges that LGBT people face as we age, we know that the important piece is low income and affordable housing. So as we talk this through this afternoon, you'll hear some models of that, and it's great to hear about the different models that are going on and the creativity of having people uh, share housing and, and the things that you're doing uh, in Chicago. So we wanna open uh, the time now for questions and answers, and uh, for the folks who are watching us online, uh, please remember that you can send in questions or you can tweet questions, but we won't tweet our answers. Uh, questions from the audience. Hi, I'm Susan Hester. I'd just be curious to hear more about the specifics, you know, both any of the three of you, for how you are managing the financing around the creation of the housing. You know, how, you know what's, what, who are you working with? Is it, are there public-private partnerships, et cetera? Yes, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so funding right now, which is not secured, I think we just uh, successfully um, competed to get the land to build the housing. So now they're, we're working on the, the financing piece of it. So what I have here are... Uh, folks that we're going after. So there's the Chicago Community Loan Funders, Illinois Facilities Fund. Um, we're also going after low-income housing tax credit, um, city, state, and private funding. So I wish I could speak more to that, but that's sort of just what I have right now. And I think that actually, I know that Seth is probably going to talk more about this um, at a later mm -hmm. panel about mm -hmm. the funding. I assume you are, but I'm putting you on the spot. But um, so I think other people are going to talk about it later today. And we're still in the process of actually finalizing uh, obtaining our land, so we haven't taken that that next step. Um, at the task force, Barbara Satin actually wears a couple of hats, and one is working with an organization in Minneapolis that has not only broken ground, but sometime this spring is actually going to be opening Spirit on the Lake, which will be a low cost, affordable housing for, it's either 43 or 46 uh, LGBT people. So uh, shout out to Barbara Satin and the great work that they're doing in Minneapolis. Any more questions? Hi, my name is Larry Felser. I'm from Philadelphia. I was wondering if you could describe how your aging service community and your LGBT service communities are working together or not working together. Co committees, was that the question? How communities. Are communities. communities. How the oh, community. Mm -hmm. to like the oh, AAA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I guess, I mean, I certainly, in our situation in Multnomah County in Portland, um, we have had incredible support from our local AAA, um, and without it, I don't know that we would have made as much progress as we have to date. Um, we have members of our AAA who sit on our ad advisory team. Um, they are constantly keeping their eye out. So it, for us, in our situation, the, um, the partnership has been very strong, and um, yeah, I mean, we've had, we've had our, our gay seniors have been invited to participate in every county leadership meeting. Um, I mean, I just can't say enough about the support that we have received from our local AAA in specific. Mm -hmm. In uh, Los Angeles, it might be true of other large cities. Uh, the city of Los Angeles is its own AAA, and then the county is a AAA as well. Um, and we're really working to establish strong relationships. I'm working with uh, the um, LA City AAA um, to actually do uh, trainings for all the multi-purpose centers, the senior centers that are multi-purpose centers, which we haven't, 
uh, really been able to do as of yet. Um, part of that is just the structure of uh, how the training got set up at the LA Gay and Lesbian Center. But I think that for us, it's really, it's kind of a, a rich field. And I come from Portland, so I'm used to a very close relationship um, with the AAA. And, uh, but that being said, you know, there are uh, lots of people who provide services through um, LA County, LA City, um, Orange County, and people are literally coming out of the woodwork to get trained um, to actually build their cultural competency for their individual piece of service provision. And so that, I think, is very hopeful for us. In Chicago, I think there's a similar um, scenario. We've had tremendous response from main service agent providers wanting to be trained on being culturally competent to provide care to LGBT older adults. Uh, we work with the mayor's office. We are funded by the city of Chicago for our congregate meal program. We work with a lot of what would be considered mainstream agent providers like CJE Senior Life, um, Mather's Life, Heartland Alliance, uh, which we're going to be doing the, the senior housing with. So folks are clamoring at our doors to, to work with us. We had a wellness fair this past September and had you know, over 40 vendors uh, come and, and, and be a part of that. So I think the response has been really incredible in, in wanting to genuinely, or maybe they see it as a, as a market <laughs> um, to, 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 to reach out to. And can I think nationally, um, I want to give a shout out to, I'm, up, I'm in Minneapolis today, uh, Regine Moore, Kathy Grogan, and Kelly, uh, I'm going to block on Kelly's Not last there. name, Malcolm, who um, worked with the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging to do a national research piece on readiness, training to serve, readiness to serve. Um, and what we found is that there is a great willingness in area AAAs to receive training, to provide services, um, and there's some change, you know, depending upon location and whatever, but I think the important piece of that is the willingness of the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging to work collaboratively with the LGBT community uh, to, to provide and reach out and see where those services and the training that is necessary to provide them can be available. Yeah. Hey, yeah, Shannon Minner with National Center for Lesbian Rights. Thank you all so much. This is fantastic. You know, my anecdotal uh, experience as um, an advocate is that transgender elders in particular are just, many of them are so fearful and so isolated that they're not participating in any kind of housing-related programs or activities or resources. And I was just really curious, are you all hearing, what are you hearing from all the groups you're partnering with and... Are people seeing transgender clients? And if so, like, what kind of, how's that going? Well, uh, I can't say that I'm hearing from other service providers that they're seeing a lot of transgender seniors. Um, and, uh, you know, in our programming, we have transgender seniors that are involved, but not nearly the numbers that I think would represent the true population. Um, you know, we have to do a better job about creating safe space for our transgender seniors. So, uh, you know, we've done this with our uh, monolingual and bilingual Spanish-speaking seniors and saw a huge influx of people. Um, and actually, my uh, one of my case managers, Gabriela Martinez, is now putting together uh, a small support group, kind of a chat group at first, um, for transgender seniors because what we have found is while we have a lot of different programming throughout uh, the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, uh, the, the group that was meeting, the uh, particularly women, uh, transgender women that were meeting, felt like they really weren't having their issues addressed because there were uh, you know, transgender women in their 20s, their 30s, and they were in their 60s and 70s, totally different life experience, mm -hmm. um, and they didn't actually feel comfortable talking about the issues that they were having. Um, and so we're now working with them to actually establish an open space for them. Um, 
I think that we're doing a better job, but I think they're just within our organization, there's more that, uh, that we can do. And I really, um, I really haven't heard of, of people doing any type of outreach or, or providing access to that group. We, I, <laughs> I would say ditto. <laughs> um, I think we can do a much better job of providing specific and tailored services for transgender older adults. We also need to do a better job in reaching HIV positive uh, older adults and women. We are just not uh, really reaching those, those, those groups. So. Um, we're constantly challenged, as I'm sure many of you who work in nonprofit settings, we have limited resources. Like I said, we have two staff members uh, trying to provide all of these services. So it's certainly something that we are aware of, and we are trying to do, you know, sort of the best that we can. Um, we recently uh, were awarded funding from Pride specifically for the purpose of enhancing our outreach to transgender seniors. Um, we've had a fairly recent influx of transgender seniors in our program. Um, not, not a lot, but a handful, um, and have some activities geared specifically towards that cohort coming up in the next year. And, but many thanks to Pride for helping us to do that. Um, I'm hoping that at some point this afternoon there'll be talk or mention of the Transgender Aging Network that is a project of SAGE and the National Center for Transgender Equality, which has been meeting uh, and will be coming out with some specific policy recommendations for transgender elders. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about that as we go through the day. Question? Comment is a question. I was really struck by what Maya said about having several populations, communities um, in the same service provided anonymity. And it struck me that one of the paradoxes uh, throughout the history of LGBT aging is that so many of the people that are most in need in services, of services are the most isolated and the least likely to come forward. Uh, we're talking about the LGBT communities as if there are people that are very willing to be identified. Uh, and I think that's something, what you s suggested as a model is something I think to apply. Even with gay and lesbian elder housing, uh, there was a great issue about having the name on the front of the building. And it's again, particularly for this cohort of older adults, um, most likely it'll change with the baby boomers to some degree. When we first started our program 10 years ago, we were called Elder Resource Alliance, um, again, to try to give people the opportunity to access services and anonymity. And, and eventually it was our group that said, no, we're, we're out and we want to say who we are and be there. But it, it was, it, it's important to consider. Yeah, I think we do know that the, the people who are older now have come through their lives living with uh, discriminations, with illegality, with forced treatment, and their experience of being out is going to be, I think, very different. But as you get to a place where you need hands-on care and community services, you're so vulnerable that it, the distinction about baby boomers may not actually have play there. And I think one thing that we also find is that, uh, you know, we have, we have, people who are in the closet at every other point in their life. Mm -hmm. And it's only when they are at the center where they're out. And we have people who travel great distances to come. I mean, I consider it great now that I live in California. Now, Los Angeles, because you know, 20 miles is you know, potentially a two hour drive. Um, but they do, they travel because there isn't another offering or there isn't another place that they think that they'll feel safe. Um, and it's why we started sort of a little satellite program uh, in North Hollywood. So people who might not be able to make it down to the other side um, to where our offices are in Hollywood could have some place that was a little bit closer to home. But I think that's a great, a great point. Okay. We have two more questions. Quick question here for the three of you. I'm Joy Silver. The question I had, and I was very um, encouraged <clears throat> by talking about medical services available on premises and food and programs like that. And I'm wondering, at what point do activities of daily living present themselves 
um, for residential services and when is there a particular event that determines somebody's um, appropriateness for either a program or residence in, in all of the three models that we're discussing? Well, I think, you know, when you're talking about ADLs and IADLs, um, does everyone know what that is? Activities of daily living? Clo okay, everybody knows, great. Uh, well, maybe, well, maybe not. We, oh, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe people online might not, so if you give a quick. Yeah. So uh, activities of daily living was a concept, I think it was developed by Katz probably in the late 60s, early 70s, right. I don't know, something like that. Uh, so it's bathing, clothing, feeding yourself, uh, toileting, Transfer. transferring. Mm -hmm. And then IEDL's instrumental activities of daily living would include things like managing your finances, uh, being able to go to the grocery store, being able to cook for yourself, being able to wash your own clothes. So really take care, taking care of your life from soup to nuts. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, Joy, uh, for us, there's one thing that would trigger, one ADL in particular that would trigger people um, to no longer be able to live successfully independently. Um, because if you look at seniors, there's a great array of uh, functionality that people have within their own homes. So. People remain independent for quite some time, uh, even though we might say, you know, on a functional scale, they're actually quite low physically. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that what I want to emphasize, and I don't know about the housing model that you're doing, Hope, but it is totally independent. independent. It's that it's yeah. that services can be brought yes. to people mm -hmm. and that they can come down an elevator and access care. But it's not that we're providing. Uh, nursing care, it's not, we're not going to be an assisted living community, so there isn't going to be that level of care provision. It's independent living, um, but there's support there for them to access and for us to help bring it into, uh, into their personal home. That's Which, the model that Chicago is following as well, and I, I think that's why it's also so critical for us to work with other agencies so when we do see that and determine that someone needs more than we can offer, that we can make those referrals, and that they're uh, trained and able to provide uh, quality care for, for our folks. And I think this afternoon when we hear more about naturally occurring retirement communities, we'll hear more about how services can be brought into either a building or a neighborhood to provide that kind of assistance to help people keep their independence. Our last question. Um, my question is really quick, and it's just a clarification. I don't think I heard it like a definition of elder this morning so far, so I just want to make sure everybody, we're all on the same page. And I want to good, make sure good luck in getting a, a definition. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, help, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something that we often sort of tussle, and I, we tussle over the term senior, elder, older adult mm -hmm. and I for my program we use the term older adult and we provide services for those 55 and up and in our program our age range is from 50 to 102 and uh, I'd say anyone under 75 really does not like the word senior mm -hmm. uh, in our program and so we're actually looking to change the name of our department but elder uh, you know, it's kind of a moving target. You know, the AARP housing uh, survey keeps getting younger and younger. Uh, you know, I think it started at 65, then it went to 60, now it's 55. I think it actually might have gone down to 50. Uh, I'm 46 now, so maybe next year I'll be part of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think we don't have a, I don't, I'm, at least I don't have my head wrapped around what is an, an elder or what is a senior, because I think a lot of it deals with how we view um, people at different functional levels, behaviorally, um, their behavioral competence as well as their physical competence. For the purposes of our actual services, the case management, um, those services are for people 60 and up, unless they have some sort of form of dementia, in which case we could serve someone under 60. When we're talking about gay and gray participants, um, they range from 12 to 102. I mean, because our participants really are just any allies willing to get in there and um, are, I mean, they're volunteers, they're our, the people who are engaging in services, they're members of our advisory teams. So um, 
but, but as far as the people who are actually receiving services, generally it's 60 and up. Thank you for your question. Um, we've come to the end of our time. If we can give a round of applause and thank all of our panelists. Thank you all for being here today and your interest in providing uh, competent, uh, affordable care for LGBT elders. Thank you. I think uh, we now move to lunch. No. no? Oh, no, we have. I'm sorry. Uh, I turn the microphone over to he who knows. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ken Carroll. I work in HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. I'm here to introduce Assistant Secretary John Tresvina. Um, but before I do that, I was asked to provide some clarification on lunch plans. We are not going to be eating while we listen to the Assistant Secretary speak. He'll be speaking for about 15 minutes, and then we will uh, go outside the doors, and there should be box lunches uh, out there um, when we arrive. And then be sure, um, uh, well, we're, we're strongly suggesting that you don't leave the building during lunch. Um, <laughs> it might be difficult to get back in and sort of keep uh, this you know, very prompt schedule that we've been on so far. So, so we encourage folks to, s to stay in the building. There's uh, a, a, a varying spaces in the cafeteria where you can um, sit and uh, enjoy your lunch and visit with colleagues. So I'm here to introduce John Tresvina. Uh, in 2009, John was confirmed as the country's Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. For those of us committed to careers in fair housing and civil rights, uh, there seemed to be reason for hope when John was appointed. Uh, he had served as President and General Counsel of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. John directed the Discrimination Research Center in Berkeley, California. John had worked on the Hill for Senator Paul Simon, and during the Clinton administration, John served as special counsel for immigration-related unfair employment practices. But John's leadership and commitment uh, at HUD, uh, particularly on LGBT issues, has far exceeded all of our expectations. From my perspective, John's listening session on LGBT issues in Spokane, Washington, uh, that he convened a few years ago, was a watershed. There, John found Mitch DeShane, a transgender man, who along with his partner, Michelle, was denied a voucher because the couple did not meet the local housing authority's definition of a family. Mitch and Michelle's story helped frame our LGBT work, uh, both in terms of the need to clarify HUD's regulatory definition of family, and also leverage our existing authority under the Federal Fair Housing Act to pursue complaints of housing discrimination by LGBT persons. John will be talking about HUD's work on LGBT issues, so I won't say anything else other than uh, to emphasize the great work um, we have done here. It has been largely because of John's leadership, support, and overall commitment to LGBT equal access and housing. So I present to you Assistant Secretary John Trespinia. Thank you, Ken, very much, not only for that kind introduction, but your tremendous leadership on, on all of our efforts uh, in this area. And yes, I am standing between you and lunch, so I will, keep, I will keep my remarks brief. And since we want you to keep you in the building, uh, our fair housing and equal opportunity, uh, our staff are serving and selling chili outside, so make sure you get some of that. Uh, this is part of our combined federal campaign uh, effort to raise money. It's an annual effort by, by the federal government to support all the important worthy agencies, I'm sure many of your groups are part of that, uh, so buy some chili. Uh, it is an honor, it is an honor to be your Assistant Secretary uh, for Fair Housing uh, and Equal Opportunity. Uh, in my role as Assistant Secretary, uh, I've tried to make sure that uh, while we carry on uh, the vision and we stand on the work of the progress made by uh, people dating back to 1968 when the Fair Housing Act was enacted. It was a week after the assassination of Dr. King. It was the law that President Johnson saw as the law that would bring the nation together and bring the nation forward. At that time, it was four protected classes, race, religion, national origin, and color. 
But the Fair Housing Act is a tremendous vehicle to look at social movements, to look at the power of people, the power of protests, and the power of responsive elected officials. So it took the Women's Liberation Movement another five or six years to get the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, get the gender provisions added to the, uh, to the Fair Housing Act, took another 12 years or so. As the nation's notions of equality have advanced to include people with disabilities in the 1988 amendments uh, and also families with children. And as progress has marched forward in that time, we have, of course, the work that we're able to do in this administration to advance the housing rights of L LGBT members of our communities. Uh, and it is one that I take particular personal uh, pride in being, being involved with, uh, not only because we've been able to lead a tremendous group of our career staff around the country, also have, have the best uh, colleague, uh, our Assistant Secretary Rafael Bostic, who has been a leader on so many issues in fair housing and, and, been, and is a tremendous uh, force within this building and throughout housing. Uh, but, but just on my own, in my own personal career and looking, looking at, at, at leaders and leadership, I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, and we did not have that many Latino leaders above me in terms of a generation. So I would look to lawyers and other leaders in different communities. Uh, and I started out in, in one of my first internships was in 1978, working in, the, working in the mayor's office in San Francisco, working for Mayor Moscone, and seeing every day Harvey Milk at the Board of Supervisors fighting the leading advocate for bilingual ballots and, bi and, and empowerment for Latino and Asian American communities. Uh, so as we look around, and I've been able to, I've been able to say, not a, I, I, I don't want to be a, just a leader in my own Latino community. But certainly in public service, we represent everyone, uh, but also to make sure that our issues are covering and our, our focus is around throughout uh, in, in different groups and, and throughout all society. So this, this, as we make fair housing and equal opportunity, our office relevant to the 21st century issues, not just satisfied with what, what started in 1968, but relevant to the 21st century. You cannot speak relevantly about fair housing or equal opportunity without addressing the continuing LGBT housing discrimination. So, f so in that regard, and as you know, Secretary Clinton yesterday announced uh, the 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 Clinton uh, the Obama administration's vision for these issues on a, on a worldwide basis, making sure that our our our, our diplomacy and our, our and our dollars abroad appropriately bring to the attention of 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 other world, of other governments uh, our leadership and our cooperation and their our insistence on making sure that whether it is asylum seekers who are LGBT having protections or protections against persecution, that this is an issue that, that is centermost in our neighborhoods and is also centermost world, world, worldwide. In terms of what we are doing at HUD, it is a variety of different things. Uh, Raphael uh, and, and I were, had a number of listening sessions around the country in Chicago and Boston, San Francisco, uh, and LA and other places. And one of, I was just t telling one of our, our career staff uh, in, in Washington the state about this. And she said, well, it's great that you're doing it in those cities, but why don't you come to a place like Spokane? That would send a message, a tremendous message to the community here. It would send a message to uh, uh, not, only, not only in eastern Washington, but in Idaho and in Oregon and, and the rest of the state that HUD cares about the LGBT community where there is no, there are no defined, no major offices of, of organizations or no real, no real organization. So we went to Spokane, we had a session, and, and that's what we, as Ken mentioned, talked about uh, Mitch and Michelle's experience. But out of that, out of that comes uh, the type of, uh, our, our, the energy for taking on LGBT housing discrimination in a number of different ways. Uh, for years, as you know, the Title VIII of the, the Fair Housing Act does not cover, specifically they cover LGBT housing discrimination. So in the past, when we've gotten calls, we've said, well, you need to, you, if you're in one of those 20 states or 200 cities, towns and counties across the country that have, as a matter of state or local law, housing protections against LGBT housing discrimination, we would refer, we would refer our call, the callers over there. So frankly, those state and local governments, they're, they're, they have been in the lead for some time. We're catching up, we're catching up through our proposed rule, catching up through the proposed legislation to expand Title VIII, but in, in the past year or so, we have, we have no longer just referred people to, 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 to those state and local agencies that have the authority, but we've also kept those cases, examined those cases, and said, is there another aspect of this that we may be missing? Is it 
not is it maybe it's LGBT housing discrimination, but is, is it also perceived uh, perceived or actual discrimination based on disability, on, ha on, 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 on being HIV positive? Does it relate to family status? So in that period of time, we have increased the number of calls on our, uh, to our hotline on on LGBT housing discrimination, I think sometimes seven times as many or 15 times as many calls are coming in. So we're able to, we're able to act. The secretary has also led to make sure that HUD, recipients of HUD uh, funds, the, uh, the discretionary HUD funds, that as a, as a condition of applying for discretionary HUD funds, these, the, the funding applicants cannot have a violation, a finding or a violation of a state or local LGBT housing discrimination law. So that is putting, putting more muscle and more money uh, behind this effort. Our focal point, of course, has been our proposed rule. And while our proposed rule is now in its final, final stages, it's over at OMB. And when it's at OMB, there's very, very little I can say. But what I can say, uh, public, pub, what I can, I can recount to you uh, what we have previously said publicly about this rule, because it, it takes on uh, it, it, it focuses on sexual orientation, marital status, uh, ge gender identity, to make sure that there are not inquiries uh, b based on those uh, matters, and, and that the f uh, FHA loans, are, that is not a grounds for denial, uh, in inquiries or, 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 or LGBT status, uh, a grounds for denial for, for, for loans. Uh, some of the other things that, that we have done, um, it, over, overall this, this proposal will clarifies uh, the most inclusive definition of family to, to, to make sure that we are relevant to the, to the families of the 21st century, all the families of the 21st century. Uh, beyond that, in terms of our own investigative authority, uh, we have uh, looked to, uh, because Title, Title VII in fair employment is very close to Title VIII in terms of the development of the, uh, development of the law, different aspects, a case coming from, from the Library of Congress uh, dealing with transgender uh, status in, in employment gives us a greater strength to be able to look at, uh, to, to be able to look at transgender as, as a matter of ge gender identity as a part of gender discrimination. So there are ways we, we can uh, adequately and appropriately uh, advance uh, the fight against LGBT housing discrimination within, the, within our current powers. Uh, we continue to look to Congress and for, uh, for uh, enactment of uh, the law uh, that was proposed uh, by, uh, by uh, I'm forgetting the, 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 our uh, former chairman of the House uh, Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution, uh, Gerald Nadler of New York, has always been a leader in this. He continues to have legislation in that area. Uh, but overall, I think to say in, in, in my limited time with you today, uh, I'm going to be over at the, uh, I just saw Kathleen, I'm going to be over at the uh, center tomorrow in Los Angeles, uh, hearing from members of the community as well. We want to continue to be, have our doors open uh, to you. Uh, our doors here in Washington and, and in the 43 field offices around the country to continue to, to get the advice that we need uh, as we move forward on, on implementing this rule. It's going to be implementing it and, and making sure that all of HUD understands what it is, what LGBT housing discrimination is. It's an opportunity, I know, for the, for the Employees Association to have a greater profile, talk about these issues. Uh, so it's, uh, as we move forward into the inevitable proposal of the rule and final rule, implementing it is going to need some education within HUD, as well as educating, educating housing providers, housing authorities, et cetera, around the country. We hope to have you as a vital partner in that. SAGE has been tremendous around the country. Um, Maya Rupert from, from, from NCLR. Uh, so many people have been, uh, Harper Jean have been very helpful to us along the way, Mara Kiesling. So we continue to ask for your advice and your support and, and just your uh, ability to help us get the word out uh, to members of, of, of all communities. We can do all we can with statutes and uh, executive orders and regulations, but if the person out there in the community doesn't know what his or her rights and responsibilities are, it will, we will have not succeeded. But together, we're going to accomplish a lot. I thank you for coming today uh, for this session, and we look forward to a long and prosperous uh, effort uh, to forward uh, together to make LGBT housing discrimination a thing of the past. Thank you all very, very much.